We can leave. We leave the bar and start walking down the street. I still don't know this area of town very well, so I just follow Robert. This seems legit. <clears throat> so where are we headed? I... Irish I were drinking. It's an Irish pub. A good pun is the whiskey to my heart. Ugh. <laughs> Mary doesn't appreciate it. Puns are the lowest form of humor, Archie. Try harder. Ouch. Am I going to be the butt of the joke all night? Mm -hmm. Jesus, Mary, put your fangs away for a second. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for sticking up for me. We walk into Irish I were drinking. The bar is pretty much the same as Jim and Kim's, except for the old-timey Irish memorabilia on the wall. Yeah, my favorite dive bar uh, in my locality is actually one of the- one of the- basically it looks just like that. <laughs> it's an Irish pub. It's really good, though. They do great corned beef. <laughs> Next round. What are you having? Uh, whiskey hasn't filmed me yet. <laughs> yeah, sure hasn't. Uh, let's do it. I guess. I don't know. Live a little Archie, right? <laughs> Robert orders three more glasses of whiskey and we post up in a garish green booth. Mary slides in and sidles up next to Robert, which makes me breathe a sigh of relief. Huh. Let's sip this one, why don't we? Ah. Mary says, suit yourself. Mary immediately downs her shot in one gulp and burps loudly. Hey! <laughs> we'll put hair on your chest. You are truly the paragon of grace and beauty. Ah. Mary grabs my drink and sips on it. Ah. Hey! Ah. Archie, be a dear and get us another round, will ya? Hey. I don't know how to process this evening at all. I get up and order another round of drinks from the bartender. As I head back, I see Mary and Robert having a lively conversation. Robert roars with laughter. I don't think I've ever seen the guy smile, let alone laugh. I take a seat across the booth from them and pass out the drinks. So Edith's kid snuck some pot brownies onto the table at the last bake sale, right? And I spot that little hemp sweatshirted gremlin in the act, so I go up to Edith with the baggie, and I'm about to tell her when all of a sudden she just freaks out at me. You're ruining the bake sale, she says. I should have been PTA president. Your roots are bad, and blah blah blah. Mm. So what did you do? I told her to have a brownie and that everything was going to be fine. <laughs> They both erupt in laughter. I politely follow along with the story. That's amazing. I like you, Mary. I'm actually, I'm, st I'm definitely starting to warm up to you, Mary. Not least because some people on Twitter are saying that Mary's awesome. So hey. she ate three. Oh my god, she ate three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was actually pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> three. Oh god, huh? she called the cops and told them that the time had stopped. <laughs> oh. Mary looks directly at me. Do you smoke weed? What? Hey. You know, the devil's lettuce. I... Hmm. I have two big fat blunts in my purse right now. Want a blaze? Um... You with the feds? I worked hard for what I have and no two bit corner boy is gonna drop the dime on me. So you take what you're pushing somewhere else and I'll keep running my business the way I want it run. What? Remember, you come at the king, you best not miss. Jesus, kid, dial it back. <laughs> Robert liked it, though. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I'm just kidding, cowboy. Lay off the kid, Mary. He might not be used to your brand of humor. Fine, fine. We sit around and sip our drinks, people watching and cracking jokes. After a little bit of time, I begin to warm up to Mary. Her jokes become much funnier and much less scary. <laughs> yeah, once you sort of get past that weird, like, she hit on you kind of thing, it's like, alright, fine, this is good. But it seems like she's not going anywhere anytime soon. I just wanted some alone time with Robert. I wonder if I can get her to leave somehow. Yeah, like, okay, I like, I like you, Mary, but you're starting to become a little bit of a third wheel here. <clears throat> Could you get the next round? You trying to ditch me, pal? I- No! Because if you're trying to ditch me, you can just tell me to scram. I- Just- No, no, it's fine. Archie wants alone time with his new best buddy, Robert. Read you loud and clear, the wingman breaks formation to pursue their prey. Hey. 
Now, if you fellas will excuse me, Mary needs to sink her teeth into a helpless boy. <laughs> Robert, go with God. <laughs> nice seeing you. Come on. Deuces, nerds. Mary gets up and saunters over to a younger-looking guy at the bar. Hey. She grows on you. Does she, though? I feel like she kind of delights in making men suffer. Oh. Well, she does. But what about her and Joseph? Mm. What about him? You know, they're married, and she definitely tried to get in my pants the other night, and I gesture to her across the bar where she's making goo-goo eyes at that young guy from before. He looks like he's being held hostage. Yeah. Oh, that's just a thing she does. She's harmless. Tell that to the boy she's hanging off of. Poor kid looks like he's seen war. <laughs> Robert lets out a hearty laugh. Hey, I got him to laugh! Oh man, you know I pegged you for one of those straight-laced types. I literally have no idea what's going on outside my window right now. I think somebody's setting off a bunch of fireworks or something. I don't know. It's crazy. Oh, don't worry. I got pretty wild back in my day. Still got a little wild in you? <laughs> I have a child I need to care for. <laughs> I love... It's in all caps, too. <laughs> no, I... You know, yeah. Sure. She's 18. She's fine. Robert orders a couple more rounds of shots. I gulp. What am I getting myself into? <laughs> Think you can go shot for shot? Probably not, no. There's only one way to look cool here. <laughs> I grab the shot closest to me and down it. Oh my god. Archie. Archie. Robert looks impressed. He takes his shot and knocks it back. Oh my god, Archie, don't do this. You are not going to beat this guy shot for shot. You're just not... So, what do I even talk about? He's so cool, and he probably hates small talk. Uh, so how are things? I... I hate small talk. <laughs> yeah, okay. <clears throat> uh -huh. Too many people, and this isn't necessarily you, but too many people think that they have to fill the dead air with noise. Personally, I think they're afraid of the silence, or they're afraid of what the other person is going to think of the silence. Uh -huh. If you want some unsolicited advice, just learn to be comfortable with silence. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with two people sitting in silence and drinking whiskey. Oh, all right. I... Robert and I sit in silence and drink whiskey. I take in the rest of the bar. Patrons laughing, playing darts, spilling beer. Mary giving the hard sell to that young man. The young man pretending he got a phone call from one of his friends. Huh, maybe silence is nice sometimes. So, you ever kill a man? I choke on my drink. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> you know, watch the life drain from someone's eyes. It's not just their life, you know. It's their hopes and dreams draining away. Every memory and experience they've ever had, gone. Uh, no. Oh. Great, me neither. <laughs> Robert knocks back his shot and motions for me to do the same. I reciprocate. Mm -hmm. I'm just messing with you. Relax. <laughs> oh my god, Robert. Huh. Or am I? I laugh nervously again. <laughs> we sip more whiskey and people watch some more. Mary has her sight set on another man after the other one excused himself to the bathroom and I assume <laughs> crawled out of the window. Gosh, this whiskey's hitting me hard. Yeah, gosh, this whiskey's hitting me hard. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> Robert gets up out of the booth, shouldering his jacket. Mm. Let's roll. Oh my god. Sorry, whiskey. Inside voices. <laughs> Let's roll. <laughs> Wait, what about Mary? Brother, Mary is going to be just fine. I look over at Mary, who's lying on the bar in front of some poor sap. She's singing happy birthday to him while he insists that it's not his birthday. Okay. We make our way out of the bar and back onto the street. I'm trying my hardest not to stumble, but man, that sidewalk is just coming right at me. I hope Robert doesn't notice me tripping over my own feet like this. this is the first time I've ever been drunk. Where to? Mm -hmm. You'll see. Oh boy. I follow Robert through the street lamp spotlights until we eventually arrive at a rundown strip mall. There's a beauty salon, a sex shop, a computer repair store that looks like it's been closed for 10 years, and finally a liquor store. Oh. Wait here. I'll be right back. I hope he just gets liquor. After a minute, Robert returns with two wine bottles and brown paper bags. Oh, good. He hands one to me. 
Cheers. He sits on the curb and drinks. He motions for me to do the same. This is really not where I expected the night to go. I take a sip. Why Zinfandel? What? Nothing. I just wasn't expecting... It is delicious, fruity, and refreshing. Don't judge me. I start to say something, think of his lecture about valuing silence earlier, and stop. I sip on my wine and watch cars drive by. Let's throw rocks at shit. What? Robert subtly hurls a rock at a stop sign. The ding echoes throughout the empty parking lot. Mm. That felt good. Okay. He presses a stone into my free hand. Now you try. Uh, I don't know. With feeling. I look at the rock in my hand and look at the stop sign. Back at the rock. Back at the stop sign. I know what has to be done. I got a problem with authority. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I hurl the rock at the sign. It sails over the stop sign right into the window of a parked car. Oh my god. Oh god, Archie. What have you done? Huh? Dude, run! I leap up and dart into the nearest alley, wine in hand. I can hear Robert's footsteps behind me. After I'm sure I'm far enough away from the cracked window that I am no longer culpable for this heinous crime, I stop to catch my breath. Uh -huh. Maybe we strike rock throwing from the to-do list. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Suddenly my stomach growls, oh man, I am starving. Let's get pizza. I can't argue with that. Pizza sounds great. Where's well, good around here? Actually, I don't even care if it's good. It just needs to be edible and in my mouth in the next five minutes. Mm. I know just the place. I follow Robert through a maze of alleys and side streets until we eventually end up in front of a tiny hole-in-the-wall pizza joint. The bright red neon sign reads, Pete's Pizza Pizza. Oh my god. Try saying that five times fast. Ta-da. Ooh, nice. I can see a few exhausted-looking workers behind the counter tossing dough and pulling piping hot pizzas right out of stone ovens. My stomach rumbles again. We go up to the counter and get ready to order. Can I get two slices of Hawaiian pizza? Oh wait, Archie, you're cool with pineapple on your pizza, right? <gasps> Robert! Pineapple on your pizza? What heinous... This is unacceptable, man. <sighs> All right. Fine. Because I want you to like me. We wait a minute for our pizza to come out of the oven. I'm practically drooling at the smell. The cashier hands us each a giant slice on a paper plate, so saturated with grease that I'm worried it will fall apart. We take our pizzas outside and wander through the alleyways as we eat. I take a bite. It's absolutely delicious. Pineapple. Ugh. <laughs> Pineapple is truly the best pizza topping. Oh, sweet Jesus. You said it. <laughs> Man, I feel way better now. Mm. You and me both. We hear noise coming out of a slightly ajar door in the alleyway. Robert looks at me excitedly. Mm. Got any more of that wild in ya? <laughs> I love my daughter and I should go home to make sure that she's alright. You betcha. Oh god, he really liked that. Robert and I slide the door open and peek inside. It's completely dark except for some flickering light. We slowly creep forward, cautious not to be heard or seen. Oh my god! We're sneaking into the movies. This is amazing. Don't shush me so loud. Shh. We come to the end of the hallway and find ourselves standing in front of a movie screen. Oh, this suddenly makes sense. Did we really just sneak into a movie theater like a couple of teenagers? No talking during the movie. We look into the audience and are surprised to find that it's almost completely empty save for a row of a few teenagers in the front. They look annoyed when they notice us. Robert starts making his way to the very back of the theater and I follow him. We settle in with our wines and try to make sense of this movie. It's a romantic comedy, I think. A young man is frantically trying to get through New York to find the woman that he's finally realized he's in love with. Kiss already! There's nobody to kiss yet. You want him to kiss the taxi driver? Hell yeah. 
kids down the way notice us heckling. One of them speaks up. Hey man, keep it down! Oh damn, that's Ernest Hemingway, Hugo's kid. Ernest! Hey Ernest, I know you, it's me, your neighbor! Hi! Ernest turns back around, embarrassed. I turn back to Robert. He kiss anyone yet? It turns out that, yes, he did kiss someone. He made his way out to a tiny island near New York to profess his love for a woman who, for some reason, he knew would be there. She tells him that they hit the jackpot. He said that they had, but I think there was some subtext I'm missing here. Boo, love is dead. Shut up, it's beautiful. No, you shut up. Ernest grumbles. The credits start to roll. I stand up. Robert immediately pulls me back down. Hundreds of people worked very hard to make this film happen, and you- Okay! Thank you, Robert! Thank you so much! I completely agree with this. This is why I sit through the credits every single goddamn time, okay? Also, I did not spend $100,000 on film school just to not sit through the credits, alright? Come on, you're gonna sit here and appreciate them. Yes. You are, Archie, you are. Every single time, damn it. Look at that, Elizabeth Shelton, she worked really hard. I bet she did lots of good uh, wardrobe design. Thank you, Elizabeth Shelton, for this beautiful film-going experience. And Peter Anders, catering, fed a bunch of people so that they could have the energy to do their jobs. What a guy. We let the credits roll while Robert individually thanks every member of the crew. Once it's finally over and he makes sure no animals were harmed in the making of this film, we leave the movie theater. We stumble into the theater parking lot, polishing off the rest of our wine. Hey assholes! Out of nowhere, a rock flies through the air and hits me on the knee! <gasps> what?! Assault! My knee! What the hell?! Ernest and his friends stand in the alleyway, blocking our exit. Really?! Uh, what do you guys want? Why do you go and throw a rock at my knee? This is my good knee! My orthopedist is gonna be pissed! <laughs> Ernest tosses another rock up and down in his hands. What's wrong with this kid? You ruined my theater-going experience. Now you have to pay. Oh, well... I don't have any cash on me right now. Like, movies got really expensive. Ernest hucks another rock at my other knee. I'm able to jump out of the way, but I didn't properly stretch before physical activity and I'm probably gonna feel super sore in the morning. We ruined it for you? That movie was pretty crappy in the first place. Hey, you take that back. That was a beautiful love story with really genuine acting. Mm. You call that good acting? What classicist mainstream slop have you been sa served your entire life? What? Whoa, whoa. Have you ever even seen any Michael Powell? A Matter of Life and Death? 1946? Easily the toughest five minutes of love you'll ever witness. Listen, man. <clears throat> no, you listen. That popcorn-ass drivel the mass media is shoving down your throat will only make you dumber and sadder. You, of all people, should strive for a higher standard in the art you consume. Your name is Ernest Hemingway, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> Oh no, now you've done it. Oh boy, oh boy. Ernest rushes Robert, screaming like a banshee. That kid really hates his name. Oh god. Oh dear. I dive between Ernest and Robert, trying to stop the kid. He lunges forward, kicking me as hard as he can in the knee. Stop kicking me in the knees, dude. <laughs> Fuck my knee. Excuse me? Robert gets in between Ernest and myself. It's as if he's seeing red. Fuck, my fucking knee hurts. No one hurts my friend. <laughs> oh, all right, buddy. Talk like punk, get hit like a punk. Oh my gosh, no, don't, don't. He's just a child. He's a child, Robert. Queensbury rules. Three minute rounds with one minute rest in between. No low blows, fish hooks, J grabs, or high blows. What? What? And don't even think about pulling an illegal turn style. That's an automatic deduction of three points. I... <sighs> You'll have to designate a second if you're unable to fulfill your role as main duelist. One of your friends over there looks like he has enough youthful vivacity to handle it. Hey man, I don't want to get dragged into this. That movie sucked. Mm. It's too late. You two are bloodbound. If he dies, you die. <laughs> Sorry, I don't make the rules. Talk to Queensbury. We're just gonna go. Ernest and his friends warily back away. Robert calls after them. Mm. The Queensbury Association will hear about this. Okay, I think he's, I think he's shitting you. Uh -huh. 
and consume better content. Yes, that's, I think that's a rule to live by, to be honest, a life rule. Consume better content. Once the teens are safely out of earshot, Robert turns to me. Were you about to actually fight that kid? Mm. Are you kidding me? I would never hit a child. That would be despicable. That's, I'm so glad, Robert. I'm so glad. Yeah. You throw the rules at him, though. They always bolt. Nobody wants a Queensbury-sanctioned throwdown. But full disclosure, I made half of that up. Wow. Oh. <laughs> that was really hot, actually. See, you don't even have to know the rules. You just make them up. Come on. Let's get out of here. <sighs> Robert and I cool down a bit as we walk back to the neighborhood. I'm so sorry. I get really into the art of filmmaking when I drink. I... <laughs> Hey, you know what, Robert? I get really into the art of filmmaking all the time, so it's okay, man. It's okay. <laughs> I think it's cool how much you like movies. To be honest, I don't know a lot about them myself, Archie, you plebe. Buddy, I got so much to show you. You ever see any Sam Fuller? Oh, Jesus Christ. You haven't seen- Oh my god, Archie. Archie! Yeah. Fuller is cash. Thanks for the adventure. Adventure is all I got, buddy. Yeah. Robert throws an arm around my shoulder and we drunkenly belt out tunes all the way back. We finally get to his doorstep. Oh boy. This was an interesting night. Yeah, yeah. I liked it. I did too. It was good. A smile forms on his cheeks. A rare sight. Mm. Let's hang again soon, yeah? Yeah. I linger there for a second, swaying drunkenly in the night breeze. Robert claps me on the shoulder. Night, bud. Robert heads back inside, and I stumble my way back home. That might have been my favorite one so far. Probably because there wasn't really any stupid minigames. <laughs> Woo! I'm lost in your oceanic eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Robert. You've got dads. Oh, that was really good. Okay. Let's try Damien. Let's go. <clears throat> I'm just like, I'm going to do a date with everybody. I'm going to do one date with everybody. And then we'll see where we go. Damien seemed really interesting. A little odd, but interesting. I think I should hang out with him to get to know him a little better. I navigate to Damien's dad book page and type out a message. Hey dude, you seem cool. We should hang out sometime. I sit there for a minute before I see that Damien's typing. <gasps> Yay. But then he keeps typing. Uh-oh. And typing. Man, is this guy writing a novel? I leave the computer to make some coffee. And he's still typing. I sip my coffee and the computer finally dings. Archie. Oh my god. I must confess my excitement to be receiving your kind letter, for as you see, I do find myself available to enjoy your company. I must ask for your forgiveness, however, as I believe our first meeting did not paint me in as gentlemanly a manner as I would have liked. Oh, whoa, there's more. I would be highly flattered to enjoy your companionship at my residence for an afternoon tea and a stroll around my garden, should it please you. Till then, adieu. Yours, humbled, D. Bloodmarch. I stare at the screen and reread the letter several more times. Hey, Amanda! Can you help me with something? <gasps> Dad, for the last time, I'm not popping your back pimple. <laughs> oh, God, no. I'm not, no, not that, no. No, no. Can you interpret this for me? Uh. I turn the computer to Amanda and she squints at Damien's message. I just don't understand net speak. Like, is this how you kids communicate with each other now? Oh, totally. This is the hot new thing. See, Dad, kids got over saying lol and LMAO or whatever and decided that what they needed to do was bring it back to the 1800s. So what do I do? Hmm. Where's your pen and quill? What? <laughs> Did you forget to unpack the pen and quill? Dad, how will we address the nobleman in regards to your upcoming debutante ball? Okay, now I know you're messing with me. <laughs> Father, without a proper chaperone, you'll never end up with a suitor worthy of our land. Huh. Or our dowry. Uh. Or... 
So you read Pride and Prejudice for school one time, and now you're reciting things you know about it back to me, aren't you? Like, the first five pages, then I read a review of the movie, still gotta be, though. You should read Pride and Prejudice all the way through, it's actually really good. Great, so what do I say to Damien? I got this. Amanda reaches over me and types on the keyboard. Sure thing, dude. Regards. <laughs> Art. Amanda hits send and smiles to me. Smiles at me. Well, I suppose that's that. <laughs> I make the short walk over to Damien's house. Well, I guess you can't really call it a house. It's more of a manor? Estate? The gothic architecture looms above the other homes in the cul-de-sac. I walk past a couple of gargoyles guarding the front door and look around for a doorbell. There doesn't seem to be one. Looks like there's a knocker, though. Yeah, I pull the large, ornately carved bat's head door knocker back and a hollow sound echoes throughout the house as I strike it against the door. I wait several moments before the door slowly creaks open. Okay. It's a little creepy, but I enter the home and take a few steps into the foyer, noting the oil portraits of who I assume are dead relatives hanging on the wall. Do their eyes follow you everywhere you go? As I'm admiring them, the front door slams shut behind me. Oh, good. Uh, hello? Silence. An oil lamp in the corner flickers dimly, casting ominous shadows against the wall. Why do I feel like all the people in these paintings are staring straight at me? Why is it so cold in here? Where's Damien? Archie, pleasure to have you in my home. I look up and see Damien standing at the top of a majestic staircase with a walking candle holder. What's, uh, what's with the door slamming shut? Oh, oh sorry, there was a draft. And the door creaking open when I knocked? I accidentally left the door unlocked. And the creepy oil paintings? I like oil paintings. Right. Right. Please, let me show you around. Okay. Sure. Damien leads me around his house, showcasing his parlor, sitting room, auxiliary sitting room, and the parlor again for some reason. Oh. This is one of the older homes on the block, yes, but nowhere near as old as the architecture might suggest. <laughs> Through extensive renovations, I have been able to craft a residence that is both historically accurate to the Victorian period and equipped with the amenities of any modern dwelling. We walk past a door covered in bumper stickers, caution tape, and a black parade poster. Did they listen to my chemical romance in the Victorian era? Hmm. That's my son's room. You know how the rebellious teenage years are. Onward, onward, there's more to see. Hmm. We reach a door at the end of the hall that Damien opens with a flourish. Hmm. And this is the library. Ooh, neato. Sunlight streams in from floor to ceiling arched windows. The walls are lined with packed bookshelves, and even more books are scattered over the period-appropriate furniture. Damien is clearly really proud of this room. Let's look at the butterflies. Ah, I walk up to the glass display of pinned bugs on the wall. It's pretty impressive. Nice bugs. Hmm. I pinned them all myself. Maybe I could show you how sometime. I'm concerned I would stick the pin right through my finger. Ah, oh. uh, the pinner's gambit. Is that a thing? Hmm. No. <laughs> Let's uh, pick up a book. You know, Archie, in the Victorian era, there was some controversy surrounding reading. Many people thought the more tawdry novels would encourage youths into a life of crime and would cause too much of a distraction from work and school. I pull out a book at random and examine the worn cover. Opening it, I turn to a random page and read aloud. <laughs> Naruto struggled against the chains that Sasuke had bound him with. Shirtless and out of breath, he looked up at Sasuke. Sasuke smirked, unbuttoning his ninja pants. Aye. Okay, I think that's enough. <laughs> Damien, do you have a leather-bound collection of Naruto fanfiction? I'm just at, like, this is purely, purely in the interest of science. Uh, and also, personal concern for you, my friend. Personal concern for you. Do you have a leather-bound collection of Naruto erotic fanfiction? I'm just asking. 
Damien snaps the book shut and puts it back onto the shelf. Hmm. That's a rare book from my private collection. Uh, okay. Sure. Let's look out the window. I walk to the window and am greeted by a beautiful view of Damien's backyard. It showcases a beautiful view of the rest of the cul-de-sac. Hey, I can see Craig on his lawn. He's doing push-ups with his daughters on his back. Damn. He sees me and waves happily, doing push-ups with one hand now. Hmm, that's kind of hot. Damn, yeah, woo! Woo-hoo-hoo! -hoo. I gotta fan myself now. Did you know that Victorians spent at least 20 hours a week gazing longingly out of full-length windows? Wait, really? Hmm. No. But Victorians did appreciate telling a good joke. Oh. Please, will you join me for tea? Alright, alright, let's do it. I follow Damien to his sitting room where finger foods have already been set out upon a beautiful, tiered silver tray. I take a seat on one of the high-backed chairs as Damien pours and serves me some tea. I can't believe we're having a high tea. I never thought I'd get to do this. Huh. Damien smiles to himself. What? Oh. It's a common misconception that high tea refers to the wealth or class of the people enjoying it, when in fact the high refers to both the later time of day that the working class had to enjoy tea and the height of the tables on which they're served. Oh. Uh -huh. My dear friend, we're currently enjoying afternoon tea. That's informative. Damien takes a seat next to me and serves me a tiny sandwich. <clears throat> Your home is really impressive. It seems like you've really put a lot of work into this place. Huh. Thank you. Yes, it's very cool. Like, yeah. hey, no one's ever complimented my home before. Really? I mean, why not? It's super impressive. Obviously, he's put a lot of work and effort into it. Like, why wouldn't you compliment that? So what if it's not your aesthetic? So what? Hell, I can barely get matching salt and pepper shakers in my place, and look at what you've done. I'm kind of jealous, right? <laughs> That's very generous of you to say. Well, yeah. What, what, what got you so interested in goth stuff? Uh. Well, when I was a young boy, my father... Did he take you into the city? Mm. Sorry? <laughs> did you guys see a marching band? Mm. I'm afraid I don't understand. You're serious? Mm. Of course. But it's, you know, the song. Amanda made me listen to it. Seriously? Mm. I'd love to see a marching band. Okay. Oh. Nevertheless, I've always had a love for art, history, and fashion. What started off as a small hobby of collecting taxidermied animals grew into sort of an obsession. An obsession. It's a privilege to be able to appreciate the lives and culture of those who came before us, I think. Why not go all the way? Hmm. I like not dying when I catch a cold. Yeah. It's fair. That's fair. I also am kind of a history nerd, but, like, you couldn't pay me to actually live exactly like they would have, because penicillin is awesome. I like penicillin. Antibiotics are great. He takes a sip of tea. I can acknowledge that w there were many very terrible things about the Victorian era, and try to live a life that strictly aligns with those ideals. And to try to live a life that strictly aligns with those ideals would be admittedly horrid. Okay, I like you, Damien. I like you. Hmm. But I think it takes a critical mind to truly appreciate something to the fullest, to be cognizant of its flaws, and love it all the same. You're so good, Damien. I like you. That's awesome. Tell me, Archie, do you have any hobbies? Oh, man, I do, but I don't know if I care about anything the way you care about this stuff. <laughs> well, I'd love to hear about your interests. Hearing someone talk about the things they're passionate about is intriguing, and quite honestly, rather attractive. Okay. <laughs> Please, do tell me about your hobbies. Quick, sound sophisticated. I uh, love me some word jumbles. Yeah, the written word fascinates me. We spend so much time using words, you know, and uh, I, I think people would appreciate them more if they had to unjumble them. Hmm. It's poetic, really. Mm. Oh, so you're a writer, in a sense. We finish our tea and finger sandwiches. Uh. Come, I have one more thing to show you. Okay. Damien takes me around the back of his home where a variety of flowers flourish in beautifully landscaped rows. A small stone path weaves through it and butterflies flit lazily through the air. Hmm. My garden. It's very nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love it. It's great. Damien, you're, you're, you're a master. You're an artist. Thank you. Oh. 
Victorians took flowers and floral arrangements very seriously. That they did. Victorians loved their botany, let me tell you. Oh. You see, it was considered uncouth to discuss personal and romantic relationships in public, so lovers and friends alike would use bou bouquets to send secret messages to each other. Each flower and plant is symbolic of different feelings. Mm. Even more interesting is that one flower could mean different things depending on the other plants it was paired with. One had to be extremely careful, as even the style in which the ribbon was tied around the bouquet attract affected the message. Damien leans down and plucks a gorgeous, bright orange flower off of a vine. Lilium bulbiferum, bul the orange lily. What do you think this one means? Uh, thou art the tightest. <laughs> the orange lily is actually symbolic of pure hatred. Well... And that's precisely why floral arrangement is so challenging. What's your favorite type of flower? Ooh. Ooh, honeysuckle. They smell really good. And then you can eat the tiniest little drop of nectar when you pull the stem out. I'll have to remember that when I put together a bouquet for you. Yes, yes you will, Damien. He would put together a bouquet for me? Nobody's ever given me a bouquet before. I follow Damien down the footpath and admire more of his beautiful flowers. Suddenly, a phone rings. Oh, Archie, will you excuse me? I must take this. He pulls a cell phone out of his pocket. I'm a little surprised it's not a rotary phone. <laughs> Go for it. Huh. Damien smiles and walks back to the house. I take a deep breath and enjoy the heavily perfumed air. What a lovely yard. This makes me wish I had put a little more effort into that garden Amanda and I tried to start what in one time. Our watermelons grew to the size of cherry tomatoes and then immediately died. <laughs> Oh, hey, gargoyle. Oh, no, I knocked over the gargoyle! Archie! Fix that guard. Oh, God. No. Oh, no. It's not working! Why? Mom... I got the first one right! Why won't this one work? Why? Why do you do this to me? No! It's- I'm sorry, Damien! I'm so sorry! I'm so sorry, Damien! Crap, 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 I can't figure this out. Uh, oh, here comes Damien. He looks upset. Hope it's not about the garg. <gasps> oh, no! My sincerest apologies to have kept you waiting. There's an urgent matter that I must attend to, so... What? Archie, did you break my gargoyle? I'm so sorry, Damien! I didn't mean to. I'm so sorry. All I did was lean on it. I'm sorry, okay? What? I just had it installed last week. I... No, no matter. I suppose it will give me a chance to work on my masonry skills. Hmm. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm afraid I must take my leave. That's no problem, dude. Everything all right? Damien worries the hem of his coat with his fingers and looks away. Everything is perfectly fine, but I, uh... It's Lucian. What's wrong? He appears to have... Well, his teacher needs me to come to the school post-haste. Do you need help? Oh, no, you don't have to. Let me come with you. Us dads gotta stick together. That's right! Dad solidarity! You're right. This is one of Lucien's more elaborate stunts. I would greatly re treasure having another parent by my side. God, I'm so sorry about the gargoyle, Damien. I'm so sorry. Let's go. I didn't know. Um. Damien and I walk into the school and are immediately greeted by an anxious-looking Hugo. <sighs> hey, Damien. You're here in record time. Oh, no. I wouldn't miss it for the world, dear friend. Wow, whatever it is, it doesn't seem like this is Hugo and Damien's first time to the My Kids Are in Trouble rodeo. Huh. What is it this time? Oh. 
This, Damien, you have to see to believe. Damien and I fall into step behind Hugo, who leads us through the busy corridors of the school. We pass by several classes in session, and I vaguely wonder if Amanda's around. Hugo eventually ushers us into a small boiler room with a flight of rickety stairs leading down into darkness. Watch your step. I can hear faint voices drifting up from the basement, and they don't sound happy. As I'm led into the depths of the school, I recall the antics I got into as an angsty middle schooler. At least I had enough sense to stay out of creepy basements. Right? We find another teacher in a boiler room, tucked away in the back of the basement. With him are Lucian and Ernest, Hugo's son. Lucian has a bloody nose. Uh-oh. Thanks for coming. I can't make heads or tails of this. I look around the scene of the crime and see a bunch of bricks and some masonry tools scattered around. Huh. What happened here? Ernest punched me. Lucian tried to kill me. What? The room falls silent. I was not trying to kill you, dumbass. I was just trying to build a brick wall around you and see what would happen. You promised me there was wine down here. You tricked me. Mm. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Lucian, did you try to cask of Amontillado Ernest? <laughs> I'm neither confirming nor denying that. I was just gonna say, this. you're you pulling some Edgar Allan po Poe shit on this? Like, what? I turn to Damien and whisper to him. What's, what's, oh my god. Archie, you don't know the, oh my god, Archie, why? Why don't you know this? What's Cask of Amontillado? Why don't you know? Yeah, it's a classic Edgar Allan Poe short story where a man gets his enemy drunk, lures him down to his cellar with the promise of wine of, of a fine vintage, then buries him alive behind a brick wall. Yeah, exactly. Oh. It's a lovely story. It is, actually. It's a really good story. Like, it's really cre- I would not call it lovely is probably not exactly a word I would use to describe it. It's it's very creepy and atmospheric and Edgar Allan's Poe Edgar Allan Poe's use of language is extremely good, but like I I would not call it lovely. But it's that's a great story. So wait, Lucian, you tried to do that to him? I was curious to see how it would turn out. I wasn't actually gonna leave him there. What was the thought process here? That Ernest was just going to sit still while you slowly built a tomb around him? Well, it worked for like 20 minutes because he's an idiot, but then he realized that I lied about the wine. And you were cackling maniacally. That sort of tipped me off. Ernest, 20 minutes? Dad. Whoa. It took you 20 minutes? Son, we just did an entire two-week unit on the cask of Amontillado, and it took you 20 minutes to realize Lucian was leading you to, into an elaborate ruse? Do you even read the story? <laughs> I read the first five pages and then read a review of the movie. <laughs> oh my god. Sweet Manchego. It's only five pages long and there is no movie. <laughs> I love I love it when Hugo says sweet Manchego. <laughs> so good. <laughs> uh yeah, you're right. I paid Lucian to read it for me. <sighs> Actually, he didn't even pay me. So when you think about it, this was me teaching him a lesson. Damien and Hugo both have their heads in their hands. <laughs> you guys are always telling me to engage in the literature, and I did. I don't see a problem here. Alright, I'm filing this under what the hell. Don't do whatever that was again. You two are both suspended for a week. Ernest and Lucian high five. The teacher starts to stomp up the stairs. Hugo, I'll cover your class. Take your son home. Mr. Blood March, you two. Thank you for your mediation. We all head up the stairs and out of the school in tense silence. 